All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this edition of our Authors at Google Talk with Audrey Lee. Um, we're excited to have Audrey here to discuss her new book, which she co-authored with Jane Hyun, Flex, the new playbook for managing across differences. So who is Audrey? Audrey S. Lee is an executive coach and global leadership and diversity strategist who consults with Fortune 500 companies to develop integrated leadership strategies that impact business practices throughout organizations. She expertly combines program facilitation, coaching, and leadership consulting practice with more than 13 years of experience in marketing communications, product and program strategy, alliance and channel marketing. So we decided to bring Audrey here to Google because of her vast experience and also because Google is committed to bringing people together in our workforce, our industry, and on the web who have a broad range of attributes, um, experiences, and points of view. We believe our differences make us stronger and produce better, more innovative work. So we recognize, though, that we're not where we want to be when it comes to diversity, especially in tech and leadership. And that's where Flex comes in. Um, the book expounds on the vital skill of flexing, the art of switching between leadership styles to more effectively work with people who are different than you. This critical skill allows managers to navigate successfully the diverse business environment of today and tomorrow. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Audrey up to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to come to Google here in Mountain View. And just wanted to say that I started my career and worked out here in Silicon Valley for 12 years before moving to New York City and making that my, uh, my current home and starting my work in leadership development. So I'm really grateful to be back. And um, I just, I remember uh, the Silicon Valley when 237 was a two-lane highway, right? And uh, the biggest thing here in Mountain View was uh, Shoreline Amphitheater, so it's changed a lot. So I'm grateful to be here and um, really thank AGN for inviting me to talk a little bit about um, Asian diversity um, and leadership development here uh, at Google and in this conversation. So I just wanted to start out by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a first-generation Asian uh, American-born Chinese, and my parents immigrated from China here in the late 50s and 60s, and I was born here in the United States and raised here. Um, so I have lots of stories and a lot of experience that crosses cultures because I grew up very bicultural, and my father was very Chinese, and my parents were had very strong Confucian values, which they instilled in us. You know, there was no English spoken at home. We ate only Chinese food, and one of my first bicultural navigating experiences happened when I was very young in elementary school, when I went to school with my lunch in a Tupperware with rice and some soy sauce chicken, right? So I, it's delicious because my mom was a great cook, but you know, as I sat down for lunch, I realized that when my friends took out their brown bags with their peanut butter and jelly and their bologna sandwiches with Fritos, that I basically had a lunch that was not tradable. So I had completely destroyed my social capital. Nobody wanted anything that I had. And in elementary school, that's a really big deal, right? So all of a sudden, you find yourself not quite fitting in with the group. And so I have to say that um, you know, my father's Confucian values kind of went a little bit deeper than just you know, food and language and that type of thing. And his um, values were especially pronounced and especially deep in the area of authority and humility and how the different roles in the family, as the youngest girl in the family, um, the different roles that you played in the family, and what that meant in our family with the respect for authority was that my dad was king. And you did not question him, you did not challenge him, you didn't look at him wrong, certainly not with any direct eye contact. And he also made it very clear that my sister and I were not to talk about our accomplishments. Right? So we weren't to talk about how well we did. And I have a distinct memory coming back home one day after doing particularly well on an assignment and getting praise from my peers and my teacher and saying, I'm so excited. I did great on this project. And he looked at me and really frowned and said really adamantly, that is not for you to say. It is not for you to say that you did a good job. You let your teacher tell you that you did a good job. And then you know, don't say anything about that. You know, don't even really accept it. 
because they will tell you when you're doing a good job, and that is your role. And that's what humility looked like for my father. And I know for some of you, some of you are nodding <laughs> with this experience. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's really foreign or that's really harsh that he would do that. But for my father, his, his value of humility was so strong that he really wanted to instill that on, in us. And that's what humility looked like to him. Don't talk about yourself. Don't ever do that. And it's the role of the person who's in authority or the teacher to tell you what you're worth. Right, so fast forward about 15 years. I started my career in technology. And you know, I thought I was doing pretty well. I, you know, Nat was able to um, initiate a lot of my career direction. I really loved networking. Um, and I thought I was doing pretty well in, in, in starting my career. And every once in a while, I would have a moment where it felt like, I brought the wrong lunch, you know, where sometimes my values didn't quite match up with the environment around me, or I wasn't communicating in a way that everyone else was communicating. Maybe I was a little bit different, but I couldn't really put my finger on it um, until I started my own marketing practice about six to seven years into my career. And that's where I had an aha moment about how my values and how my cultural background really impacted how I behaved in the workplace. I had just started my marketing practice, and I was starting to put out proposals and talking to prospective clients. And in doing that, I discovered I had to put a dollar sign <laughs> behind my experience and my expertise. And not only that, I had to defend it. And I, was, I remember being in front of my future client and talking about the proposal and getting to that line item and having him start negotiating with me. And then I thought, at that moment, I realized I had never in my career talked about my value in terms of my salary. I'd never asked for a raise. I'd never asked for a promotion. Whenever I got a feedback or a performance review, I just listened to what was said, positive, constructive, and sort of tried to run out of the room quickly. Um, because it was, it was something that I was just going to accept. I was going to accept any salary raise that I got. Because who would know better than my boss right? what I was worth? So um, I learned that that was my, not my job to ascribe value to who I was. So I was perfectly happy with that until I started my own business. And it was in that moment that I learned I actually had to play by a different set of rules. But I could still, I had to think through what my values were with respect for authority, with humility, and decide how I was going to act in that situation. Because the person I was talking to expected me to negotiate. They expected me to know my own value and to defend it. And that was the exchange I was having. And in that moment, I realized that I had to do a little bit to adapt to my environment and to um, understanding what that played in my career. So this incident and many others in early in my career really started me on this long journey of doing some deep digging and deep soul searching and really finding out what was in my background. Really, what was underneath the surface that really impacted how I communicated, how I came across, and ultimately what perceptions were out there about me in the workplace, where you know, my you know, career decisions really mattered and people were making judgments on me based on what they saw. And you know, I think that might be true for some of you, that you know, sometimes when you go out there, if you're perhaps different than the dominant culture of your team or of the organization, you might maybe feel a little bit out of place, or maybe you fall outside of the old boys network. You might f be communicating a little bit different. You might feel that. And what do you do if you're different from the dominant culture? right? And maybe those who are listening who are in the dominant culture, what do you do when you see or you experience someone who is different than you? who leads different than you, who communicates different than you, who maybe seems to be exhibiting behaviors that aren't what you would consider leadership potential. What do you do in those situations? And I think, what do we all do to move the conversation of diversity just beyond um, a sectioned off department that talks about differences into the realm of management and leadership development? So that's what I really want to, um, to talk about is um, the changing landscape of our workforce and our talent and our environment, how it's changing here in the United States, and how that affects us. Because I think a lot of you also have global roles in addition to perhaps working with a lot of um, diverse team members. So let's take a quick look um, just through some of the numbers. 
right? So won't dwell too much on this, but women now make up about half of the workforce, and they um, hold about 70% of glowing bi uh, global bi buying decisions. Multiculturals as a group, 36% of the labor force, $3.3 trillion in buying power. And millennials, a new generation, 80 million millennials comprising 46% of the labor force by 2020, and they also hold $1.3 trillion in buying power. And there's quite a bit of research that shows companies who have diverse um, leadership and workforces really have a higher profitability and increase in bottom line. So a, cat a recent Catalyst report um, shows that there is an increase in, in sales um, by 73% and 83% uh, return on equity for companies that had diverse board and executive committees. Um, usually, they were doing a study on having women in those executive positions. So we see that we have this changing landscape. We have a changing workforce. They actually have quite a bit of influence right, on our, both our companies and the market. It's quite a bit of power. How do we leverage this? And as we look at the numbers, you know, we, the workforce is so different than when I first started my, my career back in the 90s. And it's really grown to the present. And in 2050, or 2050, we're going to see that there's no majority culture, right, with the fastest growing population being Latinos. And currently in 2012, Asians and Asian Americans are the fastest growing um, ethnic group here in the United States. And of course, um, Google, you know, just to take a look at Googler um, numbers, um, how do they compare against the growth of uh, the diverse population in the states? And I, I know you are very familiar with these numbers and what they mean, and articles that have come out about it over the last, um, last number of weeks, and um, sort of where the opportunities are to grow for women as well as um, African Americans and Latinos. And I've had quite a number of conversations with people about these Asian numbers because they look fantastic. And I'm going to show you sort of the numbers overall for uh, the, the rest of the United States as far as how Asians are doing. But with Asians being 30% of, of, um, of Google globally and 23% of leadership, that looks like it's great, right? So where do we go from here? And um, what are some of the questions that arise for that? So some of the questions that I would have in, in conversation with, um, with Googlers is, these are global numbers. How many, per, uh, what's the percentage of Asian Americans here in the States that are in leadership, that are part of this, um, that are part of the fabric of Google, right? And how many are um, people who are here who might be H-1 visa holders? Um, what are the other barriers that are presented to Asian Americans in their actual experience? So I would be very interested to continue the conversation with, with Google to see, you know, what is the experience of Asian Americans here at Google? What kind of engagement um, issues, what kind of barriers are, are people facing here, or Googlers facing here, that they need to talk about, that they need to verbalize and, and take a look at? And as we look at that, we can really look at the real issues that impact the work, as well as the numbers, right? Because the numbers are a really great place to start but we have to move beyond the numbers and representation when we look at that. So Asian Americans, where are we now? Um, when we first started this work with a lot of Asian Americans in diversity, uh, back in 2000, um, the numbers were, if, you know, Asians, Asian Americans were 4.2% of the population. Now we're 5.6% of the population, been the fastest growing ethnic group in the states. Um, interestingly enough, 1.2% uh, of Fortune 500 CEOs are Asian, and now we're at 1.8, but that's actually fallen. So in 2011, we had 15 Asian CEOs, and now we have 10. So the trend is actually for African American, um, Asian American, as well as um, Latinos, the, the trend is that there actually has been a de decreasing number of CEOs um, in the last five years. So that's an interesting statistics. Um, corporate boards, we now hold 2% of that. Um, we have a really high rate of uh, college graduates in the Asian pop population, as well as median income, which translates to buying power in the market. So currently, we're at um, more than $1 trillion in buying power. So that's kind of where we are. You know, we have a, a great deal of influence in the market. we um, very educated. We're ready to go. But we're, the numbers are not being reflected, really, in leadership. Right? So that's our story. We're getting in the door. 
And I'm hearing again and again that we go through our careers and somehow there's the ceiling that happens and we're not necessarily advancing into the leadership positions and positions of influence. And that really affects, I think, the way we are seen in the, in the workplace. And there are a lot of stories that are out there. So I just wanted to take a, a quick look at some of, these, um, some of these stories that are out there, some of these narratives that are out there that are being told about Asians. So let me start with this first one. Asians don't really want to be in top leadership and executive roles. What do you think? Is that a myth or a fact? What do you think about that? It's a fact. Well, actually, you know, we had a little conversation about this at lunchtime because there are actually, um, you know, I, when I talk to Asians, I get different responses about their career aspirations. But this is actually a myth that is quite prevalent out there when managers talk about um, Asians and Asian Americans and their career aspirations. What I hear a lot is, I, I don't hear from them. They don't tell me. I want that stretch assignment. Or they didn't tell me they wanted that, you know, that new role or that to, what their aspiration is to make partner. They didn't say that. And there's an interesting study that came out from the, the Center for Talent Innovation in New York City, headed by uh, Sylvia Ann Hewlett. And there, this study talks about Asians in America. And they inter interviewed 3,000 people nationwide. And they talked to Asians and Asian Americans about their careers. And what's interesting is that 64% of Asian professionals said that they wanted top jobs, right? And it was greater than the number of Caucasian professionals that also expressed the same kind of aspirations um, for top jobs. So it's not that Asians don't want to be in leadership, right? So if that's the myth, if that's the perception, it's just not true. And of course, I don't know those numbers for, uh, for Google, but I would suspect that Asian Americans and Asians really want to get ahead. And there may be this myth that they don't, right? And, um, the other statistic that's very interesting is that 63% of Asian men, 44% of Asian women feel stalled in their careers. And 19% of Asian men and 14% of Asian women plan to leave their company within the next year. So, you know, org organizations are faced and they should be afraid that they're going to lose some of their best talent because of disengagement. And in a Gallup survey, um, they found that about 40, uh, 450 billion to $550 billion is what is lost by companies from employee disengagement every year. So if you lose an employee, you can't retain them, they don't stay engaged, they're, they're not gonna be in a place where they can actually feel like they're, they're bringing themselves to work. It's not gonna work out in that um, for retaining that employee. It's costing companies a lot of money, right? So. What do you think about this statement? It's best to be colorblind, and not, it's not really important to focus on differences in the workplace. After all, it's just about respect and treating everyone the same, treating everyone fairly. What do you think about that statement? No. no. Any, any comments about that? Have you heard that statement going around? Great to be colorblind. We're a post-racial society, right? We have Obama in the office. There are no barriers anymore, right? What's interesting about the statement is there are a lot of people who do think this is a great thing to be colorblind or to not notice differences. Because it sounds like if we don't notice differences and we don't have to talk about them, there won't be any conflict. You know, we can just we can appeal to the universal values of fairness and respect and everything will be good. Um, but actually, what we can't get beyond is an unconscious inherent biases that we all have toward each other and the judgments that actually are reached even without us realizing it. And I know um, I was reading about Laszlo Bach and engaging Brian Wells, Dr. Brian Wells here at Google to do quite a number of studies on unconscious bias and what they discovered. And there's also a number of studies done by Harvard Business School um, and Dr. Minaji uh, and University of Virginia that talk about unconscious bias, where they've actually found that people, as an example of one of the tests that they do, they've done, they've had a list of positive traits, positive adjectives, and people actually um, correlated that with Caucasians, Caucasian people, Caucasian faces. And then they gave people a list of negative traits and negative adjectives, and those were more likely to be correlated with African American and minority faces. And, and those correlations showed those kind of biases. So really, I think when um, 
Dr. Wells, it was reported when he started doing this work with Google, he also found that there was a systemic bias against women. And that's why women have not risen to the, um, to the ranks of leadership. So it's a very interesting thing to, to see how bias works out. And also dangerous is the idea of colorblindness itself, because why do we want to not see differences? Differences are actually what brings that innovation and ultimately productivity into the companies, into your teams, into the work that you do. And what's interesting is another study that was done um, talks about it in, at Harvard talks about how when you get a team together that's diverse, the team actually is chaotic and full of conflict and actually very unproductive when they first start working together. And the only thing that will help that team become productive and innovative is if the leader of that team and the people in the team understand how to integrate and recognize their differences and appreciate how that adds value to the team. So there's actually a lot of skills and training that needs to happen before you get all these different opinions and different backgrounds into a room and styles before it can become productive. So the argument that, oh, we just need to treat everybody the same and just to sort of lump leadership development into this general category and hope that we will get it actually doesn't, um, doesn't go with how we're hardwired, right? Because we are actually neuroscientists and behavioral scientists, they really have done a lot of studies to say, when we see someone different than us, we run away. Or we get really defensive because if there's something unknown and unfamiliar, we're not gonna flock to that. And you know, we see that's especially dangerous in this homosocial phenomenon where we like people who are like us, which means in the workplace, we hire people who look like us, we promote people who look like us, and we gravitate toward people when we're thinking about mentoring who look like us. And I can't tell you the number of times I've actually heard people say, oh, I've met this person and I can't wait to start you know, mentoring them and coaching them. They're just like me. I've got a mini me, you know, and we're going to have a whole team of mini me's, you know. And people are so excited when they find that. They find someone who's just like them. And that is a natural tendency. So when we start looking at these natural tendencies that we all have, what do we do about them, right? Unconscious bias. And speaking of bias, I think this is really an interesting, um, the, one of the latest studies in talking about the ceiling for Asians and Asian Americans is, um, has just come out. And, Let's take a look at this um, myth or fact. You know, if Asians just develop more assertive leadership styles, they would advance in their careers. What do you think of that statement? Have you heard that before? Yeah? So it seems true, right? And I mean, we want to believe it's true. If we just acted more like leaders, it would, it would be great you know, for our, our uh, careers. But I, I want to say what's interesting is the University of Toronto released a study in 2012 that talks about how the, the bias is so strong that they found that Asian, actually East Asian leaders that behaved with a dominant style, if they were warm, if they were personable, and if they had a very strong style, they were actually disliked more than any other style of people. So people would actually like and would rather work with an East Asian who is non-dominant or a Caucasian who is dominant or non-dominant. And the stereotype, explicit stereotype that they tested was that East Asians were cold, they were competent, extremely so, and non-dominant. And the expectation of East Asians were that they stay in their place. They stay in their place. And when Asians behaved outside of these stereotypes, they were harassed for it or they were seen unfavorably. So I looked at the, uh, the results of the study and I thought, what do we do about this myth? What do we do about this? Because we're being asked to behave more assertively, but when we do, we're disliked. And that also works against us. So I have to say, when I saw this, I thought organizations and upper management and people who are really guiding and mentoring and hiring and promoting um, people within their organizations really need to take a look at their unconscious bias, right? We really need to change how we see leadership and the leadership styles that are out there when we see people acting outside of stereotype, trying to better their leadership development, and really think, how are we going to start working? 
But you know, what do Asians do about this? I think it's really an art to do what um, we're going to start talking a little bit about flexing and, and what we can do in these situations to actually change this. Because these are narratives that are happening. These are stories about Asians and Asian Americans that are out there that we have to confront. Right? And I think maybe some of you have heard of these stories, these narratives about Asian Americans. They're about Asian Americans, but they're not by Asian Americans. So we have someone, we have people out there telling these stories about us, about Asians, and not necessarily ha having our input to get the full fabric, the full story of us. So the first one is the model minority myth, right? How many of you have heard of the model minority myth? All right, so in the 1960s, sociologist, uh, wrote about Asians, specifically at the time, Japanese Americans, being the model minority immigrants that came to the States who did really well, right? And they sort of pitted that story, that narrative, against other minority groups because the thought was they came, they did it, so there's no barrier. So if you're not making it, it's probably your fault, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the system. And, uh, the idea is it also invalidated a lot of what Asians and Asian Americans had to say about their own experience, about, quote unquote, what their experience was making it and actually working in the United States. So that is also a myth because, you know, it's not even true for all Asians. There's a 13% poverty rate for Asians in the different groups of Asians as well. So they're not all experiencing this huge success that everyone is talking about as we think about the model minority myth. So it's very incomplete when we look at that. Also the perpetual uh, foreigner syndrome, right? So the same um, implicit bias test that was uh, created by Dr. Banaji in Harvard, at Harvard, um, showed a test where uh, a bunch of celebrities were shown, flashed, on the, um, flashed in front of the participants, the test takers, and uh, celebrities like Michael Chang, Christy Yamaguchi, they were identified as foreigners. While Hugh Grant, and Katerina Witt were identified as, as Americans, right? And they're not Americans. <laughs> um, but it was clear that the bias for Asians, you know, they didn't necessarily see Asians as people from America. And I have to say that my own experiences would echo that, even though I'm shocked every time it happens. Earlier this year, I was at JFK in New York City Airport, and I was sitting there, um, in I was in line, and someone approached me and said, hey, you know, are you going to Hawaii? I said, uh, no, I'm not going to Hawaii. And why do you ask that? Because I didn't have any ind indicators that I was going to Hawaii. And he said, oh, yeah, because there are a lot of people who look like you there. And I thought, wow, OK. Well, there are a lot of people who look like me here, too, right? So this bias, I think you've, you might have had experiences like this. What it really is, including all the stereotypical behaviors that might be associated with a lot of Asian Americans, these narratives that are about us really add up to a question about not just the fact that Asians aren't in the numbers for leadership and are Asians leaders, but are Asians, do they have leadership potential? Are they, are they ready for leadership? Are they ready to be part of the influential voice um, of organizations and causes? And that's why I think that we have to take a look at these narratives. We really have to look at them and say, what is our voice in this? What is our narrative? When we're putting it out there, the more narratives and the more stories we have about our background and how we um, approach our careers, how we approach leadership, how we approach our work, the more that gets out there, the more people will start seeing and having options to understand what the full picture is. And one of the models I found very helpful in my work is when we talk about culture, we look at the iceberg, right? Iceberg, one-tenth of it is above the surface. And what do we see? What, do, what does someone see when they see you, when they first meet you? Right? What did they experience about you? Language, your dress maybe, what you eat, behavior, the way you talk, all of those things are above the surface, right? But there's a full nine-tenths below the surface that um, people do not see. When people saw me eat you know, my Chinese food at lunch, they didn't necessarily ask me all of the cultural elements and values and things that came with that. They just saw what I was doing on the surface. 
right? So it's, in, it's really important that we understand how to get beneath the surface when we have this conversation of difference. And sometimes it's helpful for us to know how to get beneath the surface because what's underneath the surface are those cultural values and things that I call basically part of your core, your personality, right, your expertise, your um, years of experience that really play into it and influence the, ultimately your behavior and then perception. And as you unpack that, you can start to see what's my own narrative? What are my values that drive what people see and what perception is happening? And so when you start unpacking that, it's interesting because let's take the value of humility, which is a very, very strong Asian Confucian value. Okay? If that is a very strong value that I have, the action might be that I don't talk about my accomplishments. That might be what humility looks like to me. But the perception I'm hoping is that people think I'm humble because I'm so humble, right? Um, but the, the perception in, in a Western uh, culture isn't that you're humble. It's that you don't have confidence and that you don't know how to talk about yourself. Maybe you're not even a contributor and you don't even have that expertise. So the perception is completely different than what I hope to project out there. And when I take a look at this equation and I look at the dynamics of this, I have to ask myself, is there a way that I can keep who I am, right, with my value of humility, and have it look different on the action side but still retain my value so that I can manage that perception? Because I want people to experience me in a certain way. Is there a way I could talk about myself in a humble way and still keep my values? And that's really the opportunity, I think, is for us to look at the values that we have. And for Asians, traditionally, Asian values are um, respect for authority, right? We really look at authority in a way that um, we like to keep the distance because that means we respect them. So oftentimes, we don't speak up in meetings when our boss is there. And sometimes we may not talk about who we are, talk about our accomplishments, as I mentioned. Humility is a great um, example of a value. Collectivism, we don't necessarily think in terms of I. We think in terms of we. So when we talk about accomplishments, maybe we talk about what we did instead of what I did. And if we're in a very individualistic environment, as you know, America and Western corporations are very individualistic, we might, come, uh, we might butt heads with people who have different values who see that, wow, you didn't talk about yourself, you used the word we. <laughs> you don't talk about your accomplishments. And you're, you're not necessarily standing out. And they see you as someone who's not remarkable, right? You don't stand out in the crowd. But you think you're being, you know, you're behaving in a way that you think is very successful for um, how you were raised. And other values that, uh, that play into very traditional Asian values are um, saving face, a lot of indirect communication, right? And um, the idea of fate, long suffering. If you're seeing a barrier or you're going through a really hard time, you don't necessarily raise your hand and be the squeaky wheel. You're going to just sort of hunker down, put your head down, and get through it. And that might be how you deal with it. And the way other people perceive you may be just that you don't know how to speak up for yourself. You don't initiate change. You don't go and raise your hand and say, I can do something about it because I believe I can change my situation. And when people see that, that's actually a dangerous perception because they don't go through, they might not go through this process, right, where they're trying to figure out what's beneath the surface. They're thinking, that person doesn't take initiative. I guess they're not really a leader, right? So this process of looking through it, as we were doing research for the book, Jane and I looked at about 100, more than 100 leaders that we interviewed. And the leaders that we found were the most successful in their career in navigating across the different cultures throughout their career and were quite senior in their roles. They were also really great at this, getting beneath the surface, finding out and being curious about not just the behavior, not just perceptions and not just their biases, but really questioning their assumptions and getting the real story and having the conversation with the people around them who were a little bit different than them. And they, were, uh, they had those traits, and we called them fluent leaders. And we found that these fluent leaders were really able to, to do this well. And that's what we're 
looking at when we're looking at successful global leaders and people who work with diverse teams. So um, for Asians, I think, for Asian Americans, I think the tips are really understanding the context, understanding the unwritten rules of the game, right, that actually are running, that people don't tell you when you first are onboarded at Google, um, that this is how you succeed here, right? This is how you do it. Understanding that context, understanding the narratives that are going on about um, about Asians and Asian Americans, understanding stereotypes. Knowing that context really helps you when you start your career, when you start working for career success. And also, the idea of flexing, which um, Erica shared with you in the beginning of this, we call it the art of switching behaviors and styles in order to communicate with those who are different than you. So basically, can you talk to the person across the table from you? Are you on the same page? Are you speaking the same language? And are you able to communicate with them? Do you even know if you're relating with them? And so that's the onus here is partly on us, but it's also partly on the managers, the people who mentor, the people who develop, um, people in the minority, Asian Americans included, right? As they're looking, do they flex? Do they flex to us? Do we flex to them? Are we able to understand our style so well that we can identify when we need to flex. And this is really important because it's not about style compliance, which is the old way of doing it, right? You have the dominant culture, everybody walks in, everyone has to act like that, women have to wear ties, right? So uh, we're not talking about compliance, we're talking about adapting. And let me just share an interesting story about um, an executive, Bobby Silton, who at the time was the president of Docker, the Dockers brand at Levi's. And Bobby Silton, Actually, when people heard her name, thought she was a man, Caucasian man, and then she would walk into the boardroom or the meeting that she was going to, and people would be completely taken aback. First of all, Bobby Silton was not a man, and she was a petite Asian woman, right? And as she sat down, she actually has a very, um, she describes it as a warm, very open style, very relational. She wants to sit down and start to get to know people. And she found that this style, even though it was very genuine to who she was, she had to adapt it a little bit because sometimes those stereotypes you know, that people had and those judgments and assessments that people had about her when they saw her, she had to counter them. She had to actually get down to business right away for people to take her seriously, for people to say, yeah, she's." She knows her stuff, she's an expert, she belongs here in this room. She had to kind of adapt her style and flex to the environment and the context that she was in. Did it change who she was? No, she was still the same person, still warm, still relational, but she was very aware of her environment, how she needed to behave in that moment at that time. So I think that's a challenge, is that we understand the context in which we need to flex. And lastly, also, we have to understand our narrative. We have to know this process of what is beneath the surface for us so well that we can tell that story, and then we have to defend it. We have to defend our lunch, right? We have to tell our story and stand behind it and see if that style actually offers something of value that somebody may not have seen before. You know, I was, uh, someone asked me, okay, so if you have a different kind of communication style, is there any way that you can kind of let people know that that actually really works in the situation? You know, absolutely. If you have a style that is a little bit more quiet, if, if you're more collectivistic and you look to get buy-in and you're really effective at that, if you're not, you know, if you're a little bit more emotionally restrained and you're able to actually not knee-jerk react in crisis situations, those are all things that could be really great <laughs> when you're managing a team or you have a project with a lot of fire drills and you're not reacting and you're thoughtfully strategic in the way you manage your team and your resources. Those are things, if you know they come from who you really are and your values, and you present it to somebody, to your manager, to the people at Google, people might say, oh my gosh, I didn't think of it that way. When I think of a leader, I think of someone who's strong, someone who's charismatic, someone who's outgoing and extroverted. And those are very, very common biases for what leaders look like. So when you tell your story, all of a sudden we have a different story for what another leader looks like in that context. And I was just sharing um, over, over lunch with some AGN um, leaders that you know, people don't always know what they haven't seen before. Um, Joshua Bell, who is a, a violinist, virtuoso, 
did an experiment with Washington Post many years ago where he set his violin case down in the uh, Washington subway and started playing. And people didn't notice him at all. The funny thing is, a couple hours went by. If you had gone to see him in Carnegie Hall, you would have probably paid about $200 a ticket. And you would have clapped, and you would have been like, oh my gosh, I saw Joshua Bell at Carnegie Hall. And it would have been this great experience for you. And you would have said, he's the most amazing violinist I ever heard. But when he was in the subway, nobody knew, right? Because we might find a Picasso in the dumpster. But we don't know it until someone puts a frame around it, a didactic panel, and auctions it off and says, this is the value. So maybe that's what we need to do. We actually need to frame our value. We need to share this narrative with people and actually so that we can start this conversation and we can flex across the differences. All right, so this is really an art. It's not a science. And it requires practice. And I know that all of us have many situations <laughs> every day that we can practice. And one of the dimensions, I just want to share um, a dimension, a couple dimensions with you that um, talk to uh, understanding differences. And um, one of the differences that we noted, borrowed from cultural anthropology, is the difference of the power gap. And this is a very critical dimension to understand because we found that people who understood the power gap and knew how to bridge the power gap actually were the ones that were the most effective at flexing. So the power gap is basically the distance between the different levels of hierarchy that exist. And there are formal power gaps, right? Every, every organization has a hierarchy between bosses, you know, the titles and the authority that's given to um, people in different positions. There are also informal power gaps between people you know, from different departments. Maybe one's function is valued over the other, even between peers. There are power gaps between mentors and mentees, people who are, are coaching. So these levels of hierarchy are very important. And that distance often keeps people from building relationships. Okay? And there are two extremes in the power gap in, in the way people prefer to work. So we might have someone on the egalitarian end of the power gap, where they have a preference for actually minimizing that gap. They say, OK, I'm your boss. You know, I'm an egalitarian boss. And I'm your boss, and I have this team. But I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to exert my authority over them. right? I'm not going to be the boss. I'm, I'm here to, to guide. I want to listen to their ideas. You know, I'm really proud, if I have an egalitarian preference, that I'm, I have an open door policy. You know, we hear this a lot. I expect my team members to come into my office, chat, get to know me a little bit. I'll get to know them. We'll share ideas. Um, we'll talk about questions they have. They can even challenge me, right? They can challenge me. They can look me directly in the eye and say, you know, Audrey, I, I'm not sure if that's going to work. You know, or I have a problem with that. Or this is where I want my career to go. I really like that stretch assignment. And if I'm an egalitarian boss, I'm OK with that. You know, that doesn't usurp my respect or my authority. It's perfectly fine. I want that. But if I have a team member that doesn't do that when I've invited them to do that, I might think, oh my gosh, that person has no initiative. That person's a really hard worker. They do a really great job with their teammates, but they're not leaders. They're not somebody I can count on for that stretch assignment. So if you're on the other end, other extreme of the power gap preference, you might think, I think about the gap as something that translates to respect for authority. So if you have that preference, it's a hierarchical preference. And Asian cultures tend to norm toward hierarchical preferences. And there are many other cultures and groups that do as well. So as someone with a hierarchical preference, you don't want to be on the same level as your boss or someone who's in authority. Because that's not your level, and it's not your place to be at that level. So that gap rep represents your sign of respect. You're going to let that boss or that, that um, superior call the shots, give directions, be the person that speaks up in the meeting. And depending on how wide that gap is for you, that's the way you think it should be. And so if you have a boss that says, hey, you, I expect you to come to me, you might be thinking, that boss is not a really great boss because they're not doing their job. right? They're not. They're not being that director. They're not being that um, strong boss that I need. And the concept for, um, ag again, for a lot of Asians who have this very strong hierarchical preference is that you know, when they're ready, their boss will tell them, tap them on the shoulder and say, you're ready for that raise. <laughs> you know, you're ready for that promotion. Are you ready for this assignment? And when that doesn't happen, 
they might get frustrated because that's the boss's job. You know, so what do we do to close this gap and what happens in this situation, right? An egalitarian boss, how do they flex to a more a hierarchical employee? I think there's an opportunity here for that egalitarian boss to close the gap, first of all, by having a conversation. They might identify, again, what's underneath the surface and ask that employee, you know, I notice these behaviors. I notice that I never see you in my office. You know, I know you have a lot of ideas, but I don't hear you bring them up in meetings. You know, what's going on? And just really start digging underneath the surface to see what are those motivations and values that they can actually translate into behaviors and talk about how effective it is in that context. Right? And maybe that egalitarian boss, in order to flex to the style, might actually give permission to say, you know what? You have great ideas. I'd like to hear you speak up in the next meeting. So you know, I'm going to call on you, you know, just so you're prepared. You know? Or I'm going to put you on the agenda. And I actually want you to talk about it this time. You know, you're going to talk about this topic. That's really one way that they can um, to reach out to close that gap. And we've talked about this with um, several managers before. And the question that inevitably comes up is, wow, I don't know if I want to do all that handholding. Sounds really high maintenance. You know, we have to do that. And I have to say that part of flexing and part of understanding our own biases and, and understanding how to work across differences might have these initial um, these initial skills, these initial actions that you have to take that are a little uncomfortable. They might feel like hand-holding, but as you coach and as you mentor these people to do that, obviously they're going to get more comfortable in those situations. You're actually opening the door and recognizing where that plays so that you can flex. But if you're the hierarchical employee, there's opportunities for you to flex too, I think, right? for you to really go through your own process of looking what's beneath the surface. And thinking about what values do you really have that are driving those certain behaviors? Are you, tr you know, if humility is important to you, if hierarchy is important to you, what does that mean? You know, respect for authority. Does that mean you can't talk to your boss in a way that um, is questioning or offering um, information about yourself or, or your accomplishments? What does that mean to you to have respect? And how do you redefine or recalibrate that in the environment that you're in. So that's one way that you can flex across the power gap and to take that initiative to do that. And it might be uncomfortable at first, but this is where I think the conversation starts of when you're flexing, what does that look like for you? And where do you practice it? And I think you can all go back to your desks after this and just make a list of people that are around you every day, right? Your boss, your teammates. Maybe people will report to you, um, people within your group, and say, you know, what are, our, what are my power gap preferences? Am I egalitarian? Am I more hierarchical? Um, actually, personally, I'm more um, hi hierarchical with my superiors. But with people that I work with and people who report to me, I'm much more egalitarian. So that's you know, just to know your own preferences with how you work with people and that awareness, and then knowing other people's preferences too and to start flexing in that way um, becomes something really important. Um, and I'm just going to cover one more, um, one more dimension. And this is about communication. So direct and an indirect style, right? So direct styles, say what you mean and mean what you say. And you might even be thinking, if you're direct, I hate it when people beat around the bush. So passive aggressive, right? Um, indirect communication styles, um, you might relate with this statement. People know what I mean, even if I don't say it explicitly. Right? I mean, I don't want to come across as rude or harsh to anyone. The relationship's really important. And I don't want to say it that way, because it might hurt their feelings. So how many people are direct? How many people relate with the first one? Yeah. Direct. 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 Totally direct. Right. How many people indirect kind of relate with that? OK. And you know, there's a spectrum, right? Just like the power gap. It's a spectrum where you fall in between. I'm totally direct. Feedback has told me. My husband has told me. Very, 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 very direct. So you know, he's actually pretty indirect. So sometimes I'm just like, just say it, just say it, say it, say it. You know, ask me to marry you. Say it. So no, just uh, but uh, direct styles. It's interesting for those direct communicators. What do you think about indirect communicators? What's that? Drives, them a little crazy. drives you a little crazy? Yeah. Why? It's not their style. 
It's not your style, right? What are your impressions, if you're a direct communicator, what are your impressions of an indirect communicator? Yeah. They're unsure of themselves, right? Because why else can't they say it, right? Yeah. It also seems like it's more work. It's so much work. It's so much work. <laughs> right, we can talk afterwards. So much work. Yeah. Here's, here's the danger of this kind of assessing and judgments, right? Being an, a direct communicator. My first thought is, I'm just honest. I tell the truth. And the implication is what? Indirect communicators aren't really honest. They don't really tell the truth. That's a pretty dangerous assessment, I think. So when I'm thinking this, you know, in, in my work as in fluent leadership, in flexing, I have to catch myself at that moment and say, don't think that way. I have to challenge my assumption of that. Truthful, honest equals to direct, right? What about indirect communicators? What do you think about when you encounter someone like me, someone like a direct communicator? What do you think? They think that you're rude. I'm so rude. Yeah. So rude. I'm from New York, so I have sort of an excuse, but you know, <laughs> I'm so rude, right? You don't care about people. I hear that a lot too, right? You're not political, right? You don't really know how to navigate with grace, too blunt, too, I hear too honest too, She's too honest, right? So you can start to see how these gaps, and if you, you have people on extremes, start to really, um, it really generates conflict, really generates misunderstanding. And if you are indirect and you're direct, how do you navigate this? I think this is a particularly interesting dimension because if you master indirect and direct the spectrum of this, if you know how to communicate directly and you know how to communicate indirectly, you can flex anywhere. And mitigating a message is just an art in and of itself. So if you tend to communicate very directly, do this on Friday. I need this on Friday. You might learn how to mitigate by asking questions, inviting people into the conversation, you know, changing your tone of voice. Instead of saying, do this by Friday, it's like, could you do this by Friday? Right? The use of conditional. If, could, would, possibly. If you had time, would you do this by Friday? It invites people in, right? mitigating it. If you're an indirect communicator and you find maybe people don't really know what I mean <laughs> or it takes too long for me to get my point across, how do you become more direct? You know, addressing the issue specifically, talking directly to people. Sometimes indirect communicators use third parties to talk. There's um, indirect ways of communicating. Back in my day, it was leaving a voicemail at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was super indirect, right? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know. Now everything is direct because everyone is um, always communicating. Um, also, for a lot of, I, I, I hear this a lot with women and other minority groups, the word sorry, apologizing mitigates things. But if you tend to be an indirect communicator, people have that impression about you, make sure you watch the way you apologize. Because what does saying I'm sorry mean? What can it mean to you? That you won't do it again. That you won't do it again. It's your fault. You did something wrong, right? But sometimes I'm sorry just means I'm sorry you feel that way. Or that's maybe a terrible thing and I'm so empathy. Right. But you know, for a lot of women, a lot of minorities who say I'm sorry, People hear that the wrong way, and it mitigates it in a way that the message doesn't become as strong as you need it to be when you need, you're making an impact. So really looking at this dimension, how you can flex across if you're whatever preference it is to the other side, and mastering that is going to become a really great way to, to understand um, the different styles and how it plays out, the different perceptions that happen at either extreme in different situations. Um, so I really want to hear some of the questions that you might have. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass through um, these dimensions. But I want to say that they are, in, they are in the book. They are covered in the book. I talk about individualistic and collectivistic cultures and style preferences, as well as expressive, restrained, um, task-oriented, and relationship-oriented preferences, and some others. But I want to say for, um, for people who are in the minority population or find themselves a little bit different than the dominant culture, there is a message um, for us to really understand our narrative, I said, and understand your values, understand what you have to offer, and how that translates to the results and what you're doing in the organization. Knowing your context and how that differs from your own values or behaviors, those unwritten rules of the game, you don't may, may be at odds with how you were raised, right? 
So the behavior that you're um, that you need to be exhibiting may be at odds with how you're used to behaving. Think about that. Be visible and be heard in the organization. That develops influence, and it's really important for you to do that. But do it in your own style, right? If you go out there, how are you going to become visible and be heard? With your own story, with your own work, with the own value. And I know I was just talking about um, AGN, you know, the value of you as a group, of this ERG as a group. What is the value to Google? Be visible and be heard. Initiate that dialogue that allows flexing, that closes the power gap. And you know, sometimes it, it gets a little tiring, right? If you're in a minority group and you're, you're thinking, I'm always the one flexing anyway. <laughs> I'm always the one reaching out, and why don't people reach out to me? If we, think, if we think of ourselves as leaders, and we need to start thinking of ourselves as leaders, the leaders have to take that initiative. Because I can't tell you how uncomfortable this conversation is for everybody, talking about differences. Nobody's going to initiate. It's very rare that someone else will initiate the conversation with you because it's so hard to have. You know, what are they going to say to you? They may not even know, right? Um, build mentor and sponsor relationships. This is really important. That once you, you know, when you know your narrative, when you know your value, when you understand your story, you can start building these relationships in a very organic way. And that's important because you need the sponsors and you need the mentors who advise you and who also influence on your behalf, advocate for you on, on your behalf when you go for those stretch assignments and those promotions and you're advancing in the organization. You need that. And you can't just make these relationships overnight. You really have to know how to communicate and build those relationships. For those in the, in, in the dominant culture, I would say that the role is really important to understand here, too. And when I talk to upper management and other parts of the organization, the role for you to flex, it's more important than ever to challenge your un, you know, unconscious biases, the judgments that you make automatically, those assumptions that you have. You have to learn how to flex across the differences, open the dialogue um, to people who seem like they're the other. And you have to create a fluent leader culture around you. And that's your opportunity to multiply that effect, really understanding how to create this culture where you can actually integrate people's um, and understand the value of people who are different than you and integrate that into your work and into your team. So that really requires for you to be, to be curious, to understand what is beneath the surface and to become a fluent leader. Okay, so I just want to end with saying that that is our opportunity right, and our challenge to grow the fluent leader culture here at Google and to actually make that second nature. And it's really, it's really hard to do, but there's so, many, there's so many ways that we can start identifying those gaps and how we can start flexing across differences. So thank you so much for um, letting me talk a little bit about that. I'd love to continue the conversation with you. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I, uh, you know, I have a hashtag, ceiling stories, that I'm starting. I would actually love to hear a little bit about your experiences as you, um, as Hopefully, we continue this discussion. Barriers that you might see, you know, how you engage with the team and the organization around you, and you know, some challenges that you might see and, and how you've gotten over them, or if they still exist for you. So I'd love to continue that conversation with you, too, um, beyond just today. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you.